But you know, I mentioned earlier on a flotilla of boats that are coming up the coming up the lee this morning, um, and I've seen some video footage of it. It looks incredible. I mean, it's a very serious. Uh, issue actually, but to watch them come up and flotilla one behind the other and send some video footage of it, it looks absolutely amazing. I just want to have a quick chat with Patrick Murphy, Patrick Murphy, CEO with the South and West Fisheries Producers Organization. Patrick, good morning, Neil. Okay, good morning to uh, you're, you're you're not actually on one of the fishing boats, are you? No, I'm on the pier here. We're organising things and waiting for the boats to come up and doing interviews with the likes of your good where, self. And where are they now, the 50 vessels or so? I mean, how many are there? There's over 50. There's nearly 60, I'd say, is, is by accounts, and they're growing as, as we speak, you know? Can you so see them from where you are? Minutes. Well, we're on the quayside now, so they'll be coming around very, very shortly. There's a bit of noise in the background there. Neil, I just want to say and commend you on your stance on uh, justice and things that go wrong, you know, and the law. Well, let me tell you, for us, it's the same. Ireland's fishing industry has been robbed, mugged, taken from us 20%. 20% of our fish has been taken by the European Union and gifted to somebody else. To me, that's robbery. I don't agree with it. None of my fishermen agree with it. What do you mean? It's been robbed and given to whom? Given to the UK. We've lost 20% of our natural resource in Irish waters. Just taken from us. We paid the biggest penalty for the TCA agreement to get Brexit across the line. So because of Brexit, this. Yeah, because of Brexit, British fisheries, all right, British fishery has benefited from, in Irish waters? Irish waters, of course. Well, there's only two places really, Neil, that people come to fish. Irish waters and UK waters. That's why they come here, because there's very little fish in their own waters. That's why we're so uh, prized in Europe. Not prized at home, but in Europe. We are left with 15%. 85% of the fish caught in Irish waters is caught by different boats from different nationalities. We're left with 15%. Ireland has been mugged here. And people have to understand that after COVID, we're going to be looking for income from every source that we can. And we have a billion euro industry that should be worth at least 2 billion because we should have at least 40%, if not 50%. Um, percent how did, how was that waters. allowed to happen, that we have there 15%? We because nobody's talking about it, because nobody realises the mugging that went on with the TCA agreement. But and did this happen years. over years? Like, was it chipped Not away at over... No? It was a Christmas present from the EU this Christmas on the 24th of December. That was the Christmas present we got from Senti from our European counterparts. What basically. used it be in our own waters? 20%. We have no... We, we have the richest waters in Europe, and I'll explain why. We're on the continental shelf. It's where the fish come to speed, spawn and breed. So under international law, we would be entitled to the vast, vast majority of our fish. But because we're part of the European Union, we're told, sorry, we're going to take those rights from you and we'll take the fish. When the UK left, they became a coastal state and they fell under international law and they got gifted 75% of the fish in their waters. We're left with 15 and this is a mugging, and this is a, a, a no jokes. This is a mugging of the Irish people. And so you you're telling me that the UK has seventy five percent of fish in our waters? No, in their waters. In their oh, in their in own their, waters. In their own and waters. What happens when you what happens when you fish in their waters? You don't have a quota. You get arrested. <laughs> fines of up to fifty thousand. Your nets are taken off you, and you're bought and pounded. The new legislation that's coming into this country is you don't even have to go into a courtroom. You get um, charged and uh, and fined so, and uh, prosecuted. And here's the here's the kicker: if you go into a courtroom and you're exonerated, the penalties don't uh, evaporate. You still have them. And these penalties lead to a person, a skipper, if he hits the magic number of ninety points, loses his credentials and his right to be a skipper for the rest of his life. And he can't get them back. Okay, and a lot of that you don't even have to go to court anymore. They fast-track the penalty against you. They fast-track the, the so-called yeah. crime, if you like. So, where where else can Irish trawlers and fishermen fish outside of the 15% of Irish waters? Very little. You get a little bit in, in the English waters. You see... There, there's misinformation going out there. We're told, oh, 30% of the fish we catch in UK waters. The only fish that we have to go in and catch in UK waters are net drops, prawns, down in the smalls. But the mackerel move. So mackerel spawn in our waters, move up to the other place to feed and come back to our waters. And we have a minute share of that in overall. There's a, there's a million tons of them there. We get 60,000 for our country. It's worse for blue whiting. We have a million 
million tons. So, not in case the listeners don't understand this, there's a million tons of blue whiting. We get thirty thousand. Oh, for God's sake, man! And these fish spawn and breed and and and, and grow in our waters, right? Now they move to other waters for a holiday, <laughs> and they're caught in the other waters then. But they always come back. So under Uniclass law, the United Nations law, law of the sea, we would be entitled to a far greater share. This is impacting every single citizen in Ireland. We're going to lose two hundred million a year. It's a billion euro industry. We're losing twenty percent. So we're going to lose two hundred million. What, no. But what, what does it what does it mean to the take home pay of, of fishermen? Oh, from the top boats, twenty thousand a man down to maybe five to ten. Like this is, and this is all they have. Do you understand? They do, they're not earning huge money. You know, they, they, they're only making a, a livelihood out of the fishing. We have boats that are coming up here that you'll see them. They're worth millions, but it costs hundreds of thousands to maintain and keep those boats legal. They have to pass code of practice. They have to pull their stern tube, their shafts. They have to keep the boats right. We had one member who had to replace four steel panels, but because of where the panel was, he had to rip out his um, accommodation for his crew. Yeah. He had just put in. It cost him quarter of a million Mother of God. to do his boat up. The steel cost five grand. And but this is what you're talking about in the industry. And the you 60 know, vessels that are coming up the harbour right now, I think they all passed Blackrock Pier there a few minutes ago. Where do they come from? They're coming from all over the coast. They're coming from, I'd say, Galway, down from Kerry, the Kerry coast, down in the south and west, over the southeast coast, up in Sars Kilmorky. You know, these boats, uh, uh, this is their desperation. They should be fishing. They're under pressure enough as it is. It's going to cost them a lot of money to steam here in, in fuel, but they're still willing to do that because they need somebody to listen to them, Neil. And when they land and tie up, what happens next? We just tell the people about the stories, the life stories of these people and what they've gone through all their lives in the previous generations to reach this pinnacle where they have massive modern boats that can compete with other foreign fleets and yet they're told one in five of you will have to go. Oh. I'm not just saying this now, right? You have to understand, look at the news. This was the cure after Brexit. The government said, oh, we're going to work with the fishermen. We're going to help them. We're going to give them money to tie up. Right? That means stop fishing. Then we're going to find a more permanent solution, which is decommissioning, which is put them out of jobs, which is take these boats and crush them like a coke can, because that's all you can do with but them. But that's, inc- that's insane. We're an island nation. We're surrounded by water. It's a natural resource. Yeah, and it's a, a rich natural resource that we have the skill set and the fleet to catch it. And, what and yet a- we're telling them to tie up the fleet. What? A lot of our pelagic boats are tied up for maybe six or seven months of the year. Okay, what? While other boats super trawlers are steaming all around catching fish all year round. And are there other issues, added issues then with the Spanish and the French and the Portuguese and things like that? Well, I'll tell you what the latest crack was, right? So the European Union felt that our competent authority, the SFPA, weren't able to do their job and enforce the laws properly. So they revoked the the right for fishermen to put their fish into the back of the truck, send it to a, a, a factory where it would be weighed. So they didn't trust them. So what they're doing now, Neil, imagine this, just for the listeners. You have your fish, you gut it, you put it into a fish box, you ice it, you chill it, you put it into a refrigerated room which costs hundreds of thousands to put there. And now what you do? You take it out of the boat, you put it on the pier, you shake the ice off it, you put it into another box to weigh it without the ice. And you destroy the quality of the fish and then you try and sell it to market. Whereas all the other boats are allowed to come in, foreign boats, put it into the back of the trucks, wave it goodbye, they don't even touch the pier wall. As you would have seen in in the TG Cahar um, Yeah. uh, News last night at eight o'clock. Yeah, this yeah. is what's happening. Yeah. What about what about the likes of me, Hall Martin, Simon Coveney, Michael McGraw? We have a lot of heavy hitter politicians on on Lee side. Do you get any help yeah, from? So, so, so you hear the key words. Oh, there's challenges against the industry. They're the worst hits and everything else. Well, I I describe this to one politician. Do you know what was a challenge? A challenge was for the men that had to climb out of the trenches in the Sam to get to the other trench. That was a challenge. This is no challenge. This is a wipeout. This is extinction. We are talking about their own language, which is decommissioning. We are gone through three of these um, decommissioning schemes to correct the industry's uh, lack of quota. Imagine, lack of quota in the richest waters in Europe. We don't have enough fish. A German friend of mine, Neil, said this to me. He said, listen, in Germany, they believe that the Irish are looking for a handout here again. Ah, oh, sure, look, here they are coming with the begging bowl again. What's wrong with them? Are they not good fishermen? Can they not catch the fish? So that's where the fish are. This is the problem. People don't understand 
the realities of what is happening here. I think our, I think Irish people always had a problem with others coming into Irish waters. They did, like, and I understand Brexit, and I understand, like, the EU wasn't friendly to fishing ever, sure, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. So we were always yeah. on the back foot. We always had to reduce our fleet for others to fish here. But this is the greatest insult of all. We've paid double. So just to give the figures to the listeners, the EUK got 173 million extra fish after Brexit. Ireland paid 43 million euros of that bill. There's eight other countries that fish here. Why did we get caught for the biggest amount? Do you know what we were told? Our proximity to the UK. In our own waters. In our own waters. I don't know, has anybody ever looked at a map? But I'll tell you, France and Belgium are a lot closer to the UK in places than we are swimming the channel. So, like, that's nonsense. That was, that was, we were mugged. And, And the Irish people need to know this isn't about fishermen. You take that out of your yeah, yeah. communities, you're going to be in serious trouble. All right, let me get down to uh, let me get down to Black Rock Pier to see uh, how the boats are passing and the trawlers are passing. And and Seamus is actually going to head down to meet the fishermen to hear their stories as well. All right, Patrick. Perfect. Listen, Neil, we appreciate getting the opportunity to do this. You know, all right, Pat. The boats in the background now coming up. This, this is an event that you don't see that often, and these guys are doing this under the greatest. Of I know. I mean, it's a very serious matter, but at the same time, it must be some sight to behold. So, l- let me get a bird's eye view of it, if you don't mind. Talk later, Patrick. Cheers for now. Okay, Lee, good morning. Hello. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? I can, yes. They just stopped beeping again, but it's absolutely brilliant in here. Just describe it to me then. Where are you and what do you see? So I'm at Blackrock Pier and I'd say about 50 boats have probably passed by now and there's still a couple coming. Um, It's really, it's a beautiful uh, spectacle. All shapes and sizes? Oh, um, mostly sort of middle, but yeah, there, at the start there was a couple of bigger ones and some of the smaller ones are kind of bringing up the rear, but really, yeah, people seem to be supportive and everybody's enjoying looking at it. And have many people turned out down in Blackrock to, wit- to witness? Oh, I think, Neil, it was more so sprung. Um, when I, I heard about it on the news, but I wasn't actually kind of expecting it to sort of come out like this. And when I heard the beeping, um, I looked and I was just like, oh my God, that must be what it was. And I think... Most of the people here, I don't think they deliberately came, but everybody's enjoying it, absolutely. They said they're telling me there could be upwards of 90 or more. Mick texted, they're still coming up the river. There must be nearer 90 or so. Actually, now that you say it, I'm standing on a bench, and I thought it was the end, but I can see another two coming around the corner. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there's more coming up. Amazing. I mean, it is very serious for them. I mean, we really appreciate their predicament. What am I hearing there? Well, see, they're, they're blowing their horns and people are waving and people are taking videos and, yeah, I think people are showing them a, a solidarity this morning, Neil. This is what it's all about, getting the message of desperation out there, the message Absolutely. that change is needed. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't know where they're all going to tie up when they reach Cork. Oh, well, well, they'll find they'll find somewhere, I'm sure. Know. All right. And the tide is out a little bit here as well, so I was wondering. But yeah, I'm sure it'll be um, it'll be brilliant if anybody's in town. Absolutely, get in and have a look at it because the boats are fabulous. You got fabulous. it. You, you are so kind to be my eyes and ears on the ground. Thank you, Lee. I let Take you get back care, to Neil. it. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Oh, that's fantastic having her there. It really is. Seamus is heading down, and we'll get an opportunity to do some audio with with the uh, with the fisherman. Um. 60 was what we expected and they're figuring there's upwards of 90 or perhaps even more at this stage. Now, I know it's very serious, but amongst other things, they certainly got the weather for it. And if you're in the area, do show your support. It's a sight, I think, that you will want to see a flotilla of fishing trawlers uh, from all around the south coast and up the west as well, heading up Cork Harbour as we speak. Back after the break. Uh, my name is John Nolan, manager of Castle Town Bay Fisherman's Squad for the last 38 years. And today, I suppose, is the culmination of frustration the way we've been treated in Europe, the way our politicians have failed to represent us, and Brexit was the final straw, like where we as a country, like when Brexit was nobody's fault, it cost the European Union 178 million, which is 5.8% of everybody's quotas. But we as a country are expected to carry 15% of that, which is 45 million, where in reality our real answer should be 15 million. And like there's no political representative, there's no representative from the public service, 
and this has led to total and utter frustration like with fishermen finally saying enough is enough. We are an island and yet in our waters the French get 70% of the monk quota and we get 7%. You go to French waters then and we get nothing and the French have 65% of the quota in their own waters. And there's no doubt like if Switzerland joined the EU they'd give them a quota off of Ireland but they won't fight for a quota for Irish boats at all. It's a disgrace. And what's the impact been on your business and the fishermen who work with you? Oh yeah, well like in the last, like since the pandemic now has been a disaster for our industry, there's been no market support, like we would have put a lot of load of fish into France and uh, the factory refused to take it because of Covid, we would have sent it to the auctions, only they refused to take it because of intimidation from their own fishermen, when we put it for sale in the auction on the Monday, no bid, we got 10 pence, they charged us 44 pence for that pleasure, and a French board not selling in the auction day after that day for three euros got compensated 350 from their POs and we got absolutely no compensation. It was actually a hundred thousand lost in that load of fish alone for our company. And our sales have gone down ten million in the last three years, like and like people are really frustrated. Like Castletown Bear is a community of ninety four percent of its economic survival is dependent on fishing. That's all we know down there, like, and it should be a pleasure going to sea trying to catch fish. But all you have is legislation, freaking enforcement, and like boardings by the navy, and it just people are losing, losing hope, which is the worst thing. What's the outlook for Irish fishing at the moment? Well, the outlook really, like, you take such a thing now as the bluefin tuna quarter. It's a huge success story. All waters are full of bluefin tuna. Actually, bluefin tuna eats the fish that we fish commercially and yet when I approached the last minister to see could he get us a bluefin tuna quota there was a 5,000 ton increase he said it wasn't worth losing political points in Europe to get us a quota yet the Japanese come all the way it's like over to fish off of our waters for bluefin tuna the French, the Spanish, everybody except Ireland it's a disgrace Ireland's fishing industry has come out of Brexit uh, a lot worse off than most of the other member states and there doesn't seem to be the will and the Commission to be helpful helpful to the industry. For example, uh, last February on the Blue Deals debate when I asked the Director General of DG Mayor, uh, Sharnina Pacheva, whether Irish boats would be entitled to regaining some of the lost quota from UK waters. In her own waters, uh, she dismissed the idea right off the bat. Yeah, well, I, I suppose, listen, Brexit has, was a once in a generation challenge, really, and threat to our, our fishery sector. And, um, you know, from the outset, whenever the British uh, public voted for it um, and uh, with the advocacy of their current prime minister and many of their current leaders, one of the key rationales we put to them for why they should do Brexit was that, you know, reclaim our waters and reclaim our fish. Um, and that was, you know, uh, uh, massive in the Brexit campaign and, and massive in the Brexit decision, the decision they took to leave. And then was also massive in relation to its place within the negotiations between the British government and the European Commission in terms of trying to reach a withdrawal agreement and finally a Brexit deal, the trade and cooperation agreement. And, you know, it was a, a posed a massive threat to our national fishery sector and the European fishery sector throughout that four year process from 2016 to 2000, end of Christmas Eve 2020, as the Brexit negotiations proceeded. Um, and it, it, it was a massive threat to our national sector because one third of, one third of the fish that we catch uh, are in British waters. Um, and, uh, you know, if in a no deal scenario, we wouldn't have had access to that one third of fish. Um, uh, and uh, also we would have had significant displacement where other EU member fleets states that actually uh, fleets that's, that fish in British waters would have been displaced then into the remaining British wa or European waters and, and then particularly into our own as well. So that would, you know, that was the level of the threat that a no-deal Brexit and the Brexit posed. Um, and it was why it was important to try and uh, get a, a deal and one that would protect our fishery sector. Um, I worked very closely and uh, absolutely um, uh, shoulder to shoulder with our, our fishery representatives throughout the Brexit process from the appointment and during that crunch time um, in terms of uh, pushing 
uh, uh, very, very hard with the European Commission and with the task force, the negotiating task force to ensure that fisheries uh, that the fisheries mandate was uh, stuck to as strongly as it possibly could be, and that, our, that the resolve of the uh, the EU side was as strong as any resolve that the British government were coming into the negotiations with. Um, and I also worked closely with other EU member states uh, throughout that process, as, as indeed did fishery industry representatives uh, who worked very closely with their um, colleagues in other member states, um, uh, uh, representative organisations too. So there was a very strong united approach taken um, by, uh, by, by us domestically and also at European level to try and ensure that fisheries could be protected and ultimately to try and ensure that there wouldn't be any fish as part of the fish reallocation as part of the Brexit deal um, and to ensure that we could leverage fish um, and our vulnerable position in fish against other aspects of the trade and cooperation agreement. And that was the key thing throughout. And that's that's why it ended up, you know, being, you know, uh, one of the final things being dealt with because there wasn't agreement in that. And both we were holding out and, and refusing to give on it in the same way as the British government were. But ultimately, when it came to the crunch, um, there was a, a reallocation of fish um, that, that required in order to get a deal and to get an agreement. Um, and uh, while there was a lot less than what the British government were looking for, they were looking to take back all of the fish that, that the Irish fleet and the other EU fleet members catch in British waters. They wanted 100% of the fish we catch in their waters back uh, and, and a quota reallocation to them. Um, uh, they, they certainly didn't get that, but what they did get was 25% of it back between, to be allocated between now and 2026. So while they were looking for 100%, they got 25%. Um, uh, so, but it was twenty-five. It was still twenty-five percent too much as far as we we're concerned because we didn't want to give away any fish. But unfortunately, the the the, the situation uh, as it came to the crunch, we know this went right up to the very wire, and the deal was didn't happen on Christmas Eve. Um, it it did it did it did was part of the of the final agreement, and that then meant that as a result of that, and and the way that the various species were carved up coming out of that agreement as part of the quota reallocation. It also resulted, it, it, it put a disproportionate burden and also over other EU member states, particularly because of the, for example, the, 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 uh, the mackerel reallocation where 26%, it's, a, it's our most valuable fishery nationally and 26% of that is impacted as a result of the, the, quote, the, the, the Brexit deal uh, for prawns, which are, is, is, is by a good distance our second most valuable fishery. Um, it, it was impacted to the tune of 14% between now and 2026. And then there was there was other impacts, you know, you know, some of our, our white fish sector, for example, monk, migram, hake. There was impacts there up to the tune of around twenty percent as well. So, um, and when you take all that together, because and you know, I suppose of all the EU member states, we shared more fisheries with the British than than um, we shared more fisheries with the British than in any other member state. Um, uh, and all and and the, and the fish the fish species that are important to us are also important to them. Uh, and uh, so we were, you know, it was always a challenge for us. But um, it, that that th those reallocations in particular put a disproportionate burden, and also over other EU member states. Now Germany have a similar; they have a fifteen percent reduction in their national quota as well. But their their fishery sector would be smaller than ours, and certainly a lot smaller too compared to their, the overall size of their economy. Other member states, such as um, such as uh, Netherlands, um, uh, 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 is ten percent. Um, France, eight percent reduction in their um, in, in their national quota. Um, Spain, uh, much more less at four percent of their national quota. So there's no doubt we've taken a disproportionate burden, and that's something that you know I, I have sought working with the industry as well afterward since then to try and redress in every way I can. I've, I've taken the, the, that fight to Europe to try and work to look to how we can reduce the burden that is on us um, and the disproportionate burden is on us because in advance of Brexit, there had been uh, there had been a, a general sort of a principle among member states that if there was to be, why we didn't want there to be any uh, any fish part of the deal, that if there was to be, there should be, you know, equitable burden sharing among EU member states uh, in relation to that. The, the nature of negotiation and the... Uh, the, 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 the pulling and dragging that happens in negotiations um, ended up um, uh, with a disproportionate burden us because of the way that the species were allocated and because particularly mackerel and prawn impacted very disproportionately in us, um, we have an additional burden. 
but that trade and cooperation agreement with 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 Britain is now done. So that uh, to to look to how and the best way to ensure that burden sharing would have been in the way that the various species agreements was made, so that you know if there was to be any give to the British government that you would you would you would allocate the quota species um, uh, to, to Britain in a way that would equally uh, uh, using species that would equally uh, spread the burden across member states. But that's not what happened uh, when it came to the crunch. Um, and uh, so now we're in a situation where to look any to uh, look into redress and try to balance out that burden in any way at an EU member state level. It's it's now among that engagement is now among EU member states as opposed to between the EU and Britain. Paul, you're a skipper on the Ronan Ross. Why are you out protesting here today? We're up here today because. Basically, we're getting sick and tired of all the politics and rules and regulations that have been thrown down half of us and quarter cuts from the EU. Every year, we're getting it's just getting worse and worse. Um, we're just here today to go up to Michal Martin to see will they fight the car for us, see will they go to Europe and back us up and look for more quotas and get a fair share of our fish and our waters. We're back down Castle Bear, all we're seeing is. French and Spanish boats landing, no problems. When the Irish boats come to land, everything has to be weighed in the pier. Whereas the foreign vessels land in our own home port, don't get any hassle at all. Is the current policy um, affecting the future of fishing as, as you know it? Um, definitely, yeah. It is common fishery policies. No more. Just the relative to stability is gone. Since Brexit, with more boats in the water. Um, We've had to take a 20% cut in our quarters, more, just for burden sharing, and we've had to take the worst, worst hit in it. So definitely, no, we're getting the common fish policies totally, totally gone. That's to be reviewed, and the government should order that as well.